folks, it's my coaches say it's go to time. It's go time now. Welcome to the Kyle Olson Show. We have a packed program for you today. Joining me now to kick things off is Aaron Perini, Director of Press Communications for the Trump Campaign. Aaron, thanks for uh, being here today. I first want to ask you about the unilateral changes by the Commission on Presidential Debates. They said the next debate, scheduled for Tuesday, would be virtual, which in my opinion is not a debate, it's a forum. But what's the campaign's response to that? President Trump has been very clear. Uh, he has no interest whatsoever in, in doing a virtual debate because that's not a real debate. And, and, and you're right. And the Presidential Debate Commission came out and made a unilateral decision without telling the campaign. Uh, we found out through reporter inquiries and news stories that were breaking that the Debate Commission had decided to unilaterally change the format for the debate. We hadn't agreed upon that and we wouldn't have agreed upon that. Um, there's a lot of back and forth right now. The president will be cleared by his doctors if he remains on uh, the trajectory he is on for recovery, that he will be good by the weekend to be back out there. And so we know that the president can do this in person. We know we can put safety and health precautions in place to do this in person. And so for them to put their hand on the scale to support Joe Biden instead of being the quote unquote nonpartisan organization they are is really disappointing because it, it puts the American people at a disadvantage when they don't get to see this contrast of ideas. Well, and, and what has the response, what's the commission's response been? Because if, if you look at the debate between uh, Vice President Mike Pence and Kamala Harris this week, they were 12 feet apart. There were two panes of glass. Um, I mean, it seemed to me that they were following the CDC and the, you know, the various protocols. Why can't that be done as well um, in, in the, the following two debates, if that's even necessary? But what has the commission said since then? The commission so far has said that they are only willing to do this as a virtual debate, which is truly a non-starter for us. And you're right. They have put precautions in place. And even medical experts were saying that the plexiglass wasn't going to do anything. Uh, that mm -hmm. it wasn't necessary. And so they aren't following the science here. If they were actually doing what they said they would do, which is follow the science, they would allow for this to be an in-person debate. They would allow for this to happen, but they're refusing to because they don't want to see Joe Biden lose again. They don't want to see Joe Biden be humiliated again by President Trump, who has the facts, the experience, and is unafraid to put Joe Biden to task on his 47 years of failure. Well, and based on Joe Biden's track record, what would the commission do to ensure he's not using a teleprompter? I mean, that's right. That's a question for the debate commission, right? They make these unilateral decisions. Don't tell us how, why, or what they would do to make it a safe and fair process, because we do know that Joe Biden uses teleprompters. We do know that Joe Biden uses notes and answers from his staff during interviews. We know this as a fact. And so for them to not allow for this to be a fair debate process is really what they're saying when they're saying they want this to be virtual and for the candidates to be remote. Uh, it, it gives Joe Biden, and this is, I mean, this goes back to why the president was pushing for Joe Biden to have his ears checked for listening devices, mm -hmm. because we want to know that he's not trying to cheat. We know that he, that he has had help in interviews before, and we want this to be a fair process. So the president has said he will not participate um, in the next debate. Is there, is, is there another event that he's working on? Yes. Um, the president has said that he would like to hold a rally. Um, I don't have any announcements yet on timing or anything along those lines as of this point, but I can tell you as soon as the president can be safely out there, you will see him going full bore um, on the campaign trail. Right now he's about to kick off um, a, uh, he's going to do a Rush Limbaugh rally today, a virtual uh, radio rally. Um, as one of the things he's doing today, we have the vice president out, we have the family out. So we're full bore on this campaign. But I can guarantee you, as soon as he can, the president will be out there because if he had a choice, he would be out there already. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and he's working hard. I mean, there was prior to contracting the virus, there was a day he was in four different states, you know, when Joe Biden is calling a lid. I mean, the contrast in energy and enthusiasm, to me, could not be more clear. But let's let's change the subject. So House Speaker Nancy Pelosi on Thursday brought up the 25th Amendment, obviously attempting to claim President Trump is unfit to serve. 
In response to this, I posted on Twitter 10 videos of Pelosi acting bizarrely, which we have all probably seen. Um, it seems to me that there should be an evaluation of the House Speaker. What's your response to her statements about the 25th Amendment? Listen, I know that Nancy Pelosi abdicated her role as Speaker of the, as the House a long time ago to the squad. She gave them the reins, and now she is letting them dictate chaos. She is trying to use the 25th Amendment to weaponize it against the President of the United States. She couldn't make the Mueller, the Mueller report work. She couldn't make the Russian hoax work because it wasn't true. The impeachment sham was a waste of taxpayer dollars and time. And so time and again, not only has she tried to undermine the legitimacy of the 2016 election, she has tried to overthrow the President of the United States. Any attempt by Nancy Pelosi to use the 25th Amendment against the President of the United States is an attempted coup. She is bitter, she is out of touch, and she does not know what she is talking about. And listen, people should celebrate in some fashion the fact that Nancy Pelosi is the first woman Speaker of the House. That is, that is something notable. And the fact that she's done it twice, also something notable. That, that is, but she is ruining anything she has ever accomplished whatsoever by being a bitter, bitter woman who is full of Trump derangement syndrome. She has lost her ever-loving mind. The president seems to be doing well um, across the battleground states, including uh, Michigan, where I am. What's your closing argument to voters in places like Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, uh, Wisconsin, et cetera? Yeah, the closing argument is promises made, promises kept. When you look at the 47 months of success of President Trump, bringing jobs back to Michigan, protecting jobs, making sure America has a better future than it does right now. Most Americans agree, 56% say they're better off now than they were four years ago. Not because of President Trump. And you see the 47 years of failure under Joe Biden. You see what absolute devastation that meant. Joe Biden normalizing trade relations with, Michigan, with, with China uh, took away 92,000 jobs in Michigan. And his support of NAFTA took away 44,000 jobs in Michigan. And you know what? He says uh, USMCA was a better deal now, even after Kamala Harris voted against it. And they want to do away with the Trump tax cuts. You know what that means? Putting our business tax rate higher than communist China. It's clear what their priorities are. It's not the people of Michigan. It's not this country. It's themselves and other countries. And it's, it's a dangerous thing to see. In the, in the closing days of the campaign, um, obviously, I'm guessing um, areas of focus, that list is getting shorter. But where do you see the president um, trending in the right direction? Where do you see him, you know, really sort of putting that emphasis and that focus in the last days of the, of the campaign? Well, you'll see our focus and um, the focus of the campaign in, in the get out the vote effort, right? We're at 25 days to election day. And that means all of those voter contacts, we have made over 100 million voter contacts. We knocked two and a half million doors last week and made six million phone calls. We are, we are flushing the voters out now. We want them to either send their absentee ballot in or make sure they're ready to go on election day. And election day, most of our voters are probably going to show up then. So we want to make sure they're ready to go so that we know. So you will see us in the battleground states getting voters ready to go turn out. And see, that, that's, that's interesting because we have heard for years that the Democrats are better at the ground game. They're better at registering voters. They're better at turning out the vote, all of that, um, you know, in those in-person contacts and all of that. The, tr the Biden campaign finally last week said that they're going to do door to door, um, which in a place like Michigan, uh, New Hampshire, where retail politics, you know, meeting meeting the candidate and all of that is big. Um, it seems to me that the Biden campaign is way behind the Trump campaign when it comes to that. And then, of course, you look at the voter registrations, whether it's in Pennsylvania or it's Florida or Arizona. The Trump campaign, it just seems to me, is outworking the Biden campaign. I mean, we are right. And that's the thing. Joe Biden's so hung up in fear mongering that he said, oh, the science says I can't go to Wisconsin and accept the nomination. And the science says I can't knock doors. The science hasn't changed. What's changed? is the fact that Joe Biden knows he knows he has a get out the vote problem. He has a turnout problem and that people don't want to either mail in their ballot or show up on election day for him because they don't really care for him. So it seems like things are trending in the right direction for the president. Um, and so I wish you well. And, and I think that the president's going to do well if people turn out to vote. So Aaron Perini, director of press communications for the Trump campaign. 
Thanks for joining me today. Thank you for having me. This is the Kaya Olson Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Kyle Olson Show. President Trump left Walter Reed Medical Center and returned to work at the White House this week. Joining me now to discuss the president's agenda is White House Deputy Press Secretary and Deputy Communications Director Brian Morgenstern. So, Brian, the president ended negotiations on a COVID relief bill on Wednesday and said he would bring it up again after the election. What additional relief would the president like to see? Well, I appreciate the question, and thank you for having me. The president has been advocating for some time now for relief that would directly address problems facing the American people. Uh, For example, we've supported a standalone airline bill to keep those employees from being laid off. We've supported funding for school uh, safety so that schools can reopen, so that parents no longer have to play double duty as parent and teacher. We've supported uh, small business relief, the Paycheck Protection Program. Half of our country is employed by small businesses. We want those businesses to have the funds they need to keep their employees connected to their job. It's very important. Uh, We've supported uh, stimulus checks, the the, uh, economic impact payments to those who need them, and we supported additional unemployment insurance. And these are really important measures that will help Americans have the liquidity they need to get to the end of these lockdowns. And by the way, we have to end the lockdowns. We have to do things uh, in a safe and common sense way so that we can get people back to work, back to school, back to church. Uh, We can do this. And, and the president wants to do it. We know there are some people who are hurting who need some relief. So we've supported these measures. And it got to the point where it was clear that the speaker was not really negotiating in good faith towards the sorts of solutions that I've described that both parties agree on. She was insisting on including a number of things that really had nothing to do with the coronavirus, like bailing out states that haven't managed their budgets very well. Well, the president was, is not going to allow her to exploit this situation that our country never asked for. They never asked for a contagion to come over from China. And we're not going to let the speaker exploit the situation to spend a bunch of money that has nothing to do with this current situation. So uh, we are continuing to be open-minded. The president has tweeted, look, if you send me one-off bills, send me a stimulus check bill, you know, uh, send me an airline bill, send me something that addresses these problems, and I'm happy to talk. But at this point, the speaker has been unwilling to negotiate in good faith. So the Democrats, their bill included uh, the word cannabis more times than it did jobs. Um, what, what was their objective when it came to the negotiations? Well, it was to exploit uh, the coronavirus to achieve ends that had nothing to do with the coronavirus. That's one example that you cited. Uh, another example is, uh, you know, kind of expanding the coronavirus relief fund, which was aid to state and municipal governments. Um, and we put out $150 billion in the CARES Act to do just that. We even supported some additional aid that would come up uh, to a level that actually state officials have said would be helpful. But she wanted to go so far above and beyond uh, to really push sort of a a Democrat wish list um, that it was something that just was not realistic. And she kept saying, you know, we're not moving, we're not moving. Well, the Republicans moved from $1 trillion to $1.6 trillion. That's twice the size of the bailouts that were at the end of Bush and beginning of Obama administration. Hmm. Uh, These are massive amounts of money. Um, So we were very much negotiating in good faith. We understand there are some people who are suffering who need help. But the Speaker and the Democrats were trying to pile on this this wish list and exploit the situation unfairly. Well, and so you've already sort of touched on this, but I just I just have to ask, um, do you think the Speaker acts in good faith? Because it seems to me, based on the information that Director of National Intelligence John Ratcliffe released this week, which appears to indicate many people, including President Obama, knew about Hillary Clinton's Russia hoax scheme. Therefore, the whole impeachment process was absolutely unforgivable. I mean, it was just unforgivable and in bad faith. How does the president work with someone like that going forward? 
It's a challenge. I mean, it, it, it's a challenge. You know, at, at some point, um, you, you just have to walk away, and that's and that's what the president did. And people are saying the president, you know, called off these negotiations at, at this point. Look, he's already tweeted, sort of indicating we would still be willing to do something that would actually make sense. But uh, his sort of announcement that we're not going to be playing these games anymore was really the result of the speaker. Um, not actually negotiating. She was putting on a show because she didn't want to be blamed for the lack of solutions leading up to the election. But the fact is mm -hmm. she is to blame. The Republicans put forth a number of proposals that no one objects to, and she wouldn't even come near them. And it's because she doesn't want uh, the American people to have help before the election because she thinks it would help President Trump. This is a purely political game she's playing that is hurting really hardworking American people, and it's terrible. It's really unforgivable. And what the director put out this week is showing that our country endured a sham for years. And uh, really, it's unfortunate that more of the media is not covering this because it shows that they were out to get the president from second number one, and they have not relented. And it shows that what he has endured didn't have to happen. This was manufactured by the Democrats, and it was peddled by the media, and our Congress ended up wasting years and millions of dollars on this thing that was a total sham from the beginning. So what I'm hearing you say is the president, the president basically wants to pass and sign uh, various aspects of these bills, or, or, or of the bill, where Democrats and Republicans agree, but President or but uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi is saying no, it's all or nothing. Is that accurate? Yes, I mean I th I think that sounds right. Uh, broad brush. I mean, it, like I said, you know, the chief has been talking about, about this. Mark Meadows, the president has talked about this. That if they did stimulus checks to people who need them, okay, he's on board. If they did airline relief for that industry to help that critical industry. Okay, he's on board. If they did school release so that we can get schools open and parents can go back to work, okay, he's on board. I mean, it's all these things that are unobjectionable where everybody agrees. We're saying, okay, let's do those things. And the speaker is saying, no, unless you come to our $2.4 trillion uh, you know, Christmas tree, we're mm -hmm. not going to play ball. Well, that hurts so many Americans. It's really a terrible way to do business. So another major portion of the president's agenda is that uh, hearings for Supreme Court nominee Judge Amy Coney Barrett are scheduled to begin on Monday. Do you anticipate the Democrats going after her faith like they did when she was confirmed the first time? Yes, they already are. It's a shame. It, it's really terrible. I mean, uh, as the president said, I thought we finished this when J when JFK was elected president in 1960. You know, people were saying, oh, we can't have a Catholic. He'll be beholden to the Pope and instead of the Constitution. I mean, this sort of ridiculous discrimination on religious bases, we thought we put this to bed. Unfortunately, we're seeing it pop up all over the place. There have been news, recent news articles uh, sort of resurrecting this ridiculousness. And uh, we're, we're sad to see it. But look, Judge Barrett is, an, is a perfectly qualified nominee. She served with distinction on the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals. She was an outstanding professor at Notre Dame Law School. She was a terrific clerk at the Supreme Court, uh, where clerks from across the political spectrum endorsed her candidacy to be a federal appeals court judge because she's a thoughtful and qualified person. So um, we're confident that she will get through it's unfortunate that she will face attacks before she does, uh, but we're re ready to defend her because she uh, is worthy of defense. She's an mm -hmm. excellent nominee, and our country needs someone who will uphold the Constitution and the Bill of Rights perhaps now more than ever. We're just about out of time, but there's I've got one more question for you. So there have been numerous reports across the country of mail being dumped and discarded that oftentimes includes mailed-in ballots. What needs to be done to safeguard that voters who are using absentee ballots or, or vote by mail, uh, voting by mail, are going to have their vote counted? 
Yeah, I mean, the, the president has encouraged people to, uh, to really be diligent and to follow up with your local election authorities. If there is a vote in person option, you know, where you can actually see your ballot being scanned and counted, you know, that is something that we're all used to doing. And mm -hmm. frankly, if you can go to the supermarket, which everybody can, even during the pandemic, you just wear your mask, you use your hand sanitizer, all the rest. If you can do that, you can vote. So, mm -hmm. you know, voting in person is, is an excellent way to do it. If you are doing absentee or some something else, make sure that your ballot is counted. There should be a way to, to check if you go to your election site or your election officials and you're trying to vote, but you've, your vote has already been counted. Well, they should know that. And they should be able to tell you your vote's already been counted. You don't get to vote today because you already voted. You know, right. that's, that's kind of what he's talking about. And there was, there was a firestorm saying that he's telling people to vote twice. You know, no, he's not. He's just telling right. you to make sure your vote is counted. And that's what we really want. We want to make sure it's one person, one vote, that the winner of the election is the winner of a fair election. So, right. you know, that's the uh, that, that's the goal here. And the president's right. He's been vilified for it unfairly, but the president's 100 percent right. Uh, Brian Morgenstern, White House Deputy Press Secretary and Deputy Communications Director. Thanks for joining me today. It's my pleasure to be with you. Thank you for having me. This is the Kyle Olson Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Kyle Olson Show. My editor of Breitbart News, Matt Boyle, recently wrote about President Trump's path to 270 electoral votes, and he joins me now. So, Matt, you wrote on September 29th that the president's path is, quote, widening, which may be surprising given the mainstream media polls. So what do you mean by that? Well, look, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the way I would break the Electoral College down, first off, you have to win 270 electoral votes to win the White House, right? So President Trump needs to win 270 electoral votes. He won 306 last time the, uh, to, to win re-election. So to get there, I would break it down into four tiers. So the first tier, I would include the red states out there. And in that, I would include the uh, traditionally red states that Democrats are contesting. That includes Georgia, Texas, and Arizona. Uh, so uh, uh, to, in tier one, if assuming President Trump holds together all the red states, that would be 191 electoral votes. Now, those three red states that the Democrats are contesting, Georgia, Texas, and Arizona, all seem to be swinging back the president's way. There's a new poll out out of Arizona today from Trafalgar Group that has uh, President Trump up four points in Arizona. Uh, there's polling out of Texas that shows President Trump with a solid lead consistently over the last month or so. And Georgia, same thing. So uh, all of those states seem to be uh, coming home and in the president's column. So that's tier one, 191 electoral votes. Tier two, uh, these are battleground states. So we're getting into uh, uh, tier two, I would have two states, Ohio and Iowa. Ohio is uh, 18 electoral votes. Iowa is six. Uh, President Trump is doing very strongly in both states to the point where his campaign has actually pulled down television ads for the time being because they're going to use the resources elsewhere where they need to. They're very confident in those two states. That's another 24 electoral votes. That would be tiers one and two together would be 215 so, electoral votes for President can, Trump. So if I can stop you right there, because there was that reporting that they did pull down those ads. And some people would say, well, that means that they don't think that they can win those states. But you're saying the opposite. I think that it's very much the opposite. My sources in the Trump campaign are very confident in Ohio and Iowa. They they feel very strongly about both states and uh, all trends on the ground, including many of the public polls, uh, as well as uh, voter registration statistics and whatnot. And each state suggests that they're in very good shape in each state. Mm -hmm. So uh, so tier two, I think if you put tier two and tier one together, you're at 215 electoral votes. Then tier three, North Carolina and Florida. So in Florida, the president has taken the lead in the latest surveys out of Fox, uh, uh, the Fox affiliate in Orlando, uh, which, by the way, called the 2008 election. They called the 2016 election. So they've gotten these right in Florida consistently. He's up now 3% in Florida. Florida is 29 electoral votes. North Carolina is 15 electoral votes. Now, in North Carolina, you've got the Democrat Senate candidate, Cal Cunningham, is facing a major sex scandal, a sexting scandal, where the U.S. Uh, Army Reserves are now investigating him. Uh, he's a lieutenant colonel in the Army Reserves, and he was having an affair uh, and sexting uh, scandal with um, 
an enlisted member's wife. Uh, and uh, the, the, this is, a, this is a, a huge, huge, huge deal. Uh, there's national security and blackmail implications here. There are apparently uh, illicit photographs of Cal Cunningham, the Democrat Senate nominee there. Uh, this has completely changed the race in North Carolina. It was already tightening in North Carolina. There were several polls that had the president in the lead. There were several polls that showed it. Uh, and, and almost every poll out of North Carolina has showed it inside the margin of error. Uh, so this is, a, this is a huge deal and a huge step in the right direction for the president. So if you put Florida and North Carolina together, that's tier three, with tiers one and two, you're at now 259 electoral votes. Then uh, there's any number of different combinations that can get you over the top. So first and foremost, I would also put, uh, as of the latest public polling, Maine's second congressional district. Maine's one of those two states that splits its electoral votes by congressional district. Maine's second district, President Trump has a consistent and uh, strong lead. He's up eight points in the latest Bangor Daily, Daily News poll. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that that's another electoral vote in the president's column that gets him to 260. Then that puts a, uh, any number of the f uh, following states can get President Trump over the top uh, 270 or more and get him reelected to the White House. They include Pennsylvania, uh, which has 20 electoral votes, and the president's doing very strong there in the uh, recent uh, voter registration statistics, and the public polling is pretty close in that state, except for a couple of handful of outliers. Uh, then there is uh, Wisconsin, uh, which is 10 electoral votes, Michigan, which is 16, uh, Minnesota, which is 10. Uh, Biden, assuming President Trump can hold that core of tiers one through three together, uh, uh, Biden would have to go four for four in the upper Rust Belt there uh, uh, of uh, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Minnesota, uh, and uh, Wisconsin uh, to win the White House. And uh, th that also uh, doesn't even address other potential pickup opportunities for President Trump. Uh, he's competitive in Nevada. Uh, voter registration data and polling, public polling out of Nevada suggests that the president has a chance to flip Nevada. He didn't win it in 2016, but he came close. Uh, New Mexico remains a possibility. Colorado remains a possibility. Uh, New Hampshire remains a possibility. Uh, and there are potentially other ones out there, but those are kind of the big ones. So, but anyway, the point here is, is that in the public polling, uh, especially the numbers that we've seen over the last week or so, uh, President Trump is in very strong position heading into uh, the final stretch here of, the, uh, of his re-election campaign. And Biden's going to have to run a near perfect month of October uh, to uh, hold the, uh, and, and go four for four in the upper Rust Belt, which is why you see Biden, for the most part, with a couple of exceptions, he was out in Arizona yesterday, uh, and he was uh, in, um, uh, he's, he was in Florida recently, but for, with a couple of those exceptions, he's been mostly spending his time in those upper Rust Belt states, and that, there's a reason for that, is because Biden knows just how close President Trump is to cracking this code and winning re-election, getting sure. over things. Well, um, and I think that. I think his numerous visits to Pennsylvania are convenient because Pennsylvania, especially Philadelphia, is so close to Delaware, which is where he lives, and it sort of gives him a way to get out of Delaware and, and go somewhere else. But let's go back to, uh, let's see here, let's go back to Tier 3. You've got North Carolina and Florida. So there's this major scandal going on in North Carolina. Um, according to the public polling, Tom Tillis, had, the, the incumbent senator, has been down, um, has, has not you know, he's been struggling there. Um, but then this, it seems to me like this scandal has sort of changed everything. Is that, could that, and granted there's, you know, what, uh, about a month, less than a month ago, um, could that turn the tide in, in North Carolina? And is that what you're seeing there? Absolutely, it can. And I think it is turning the tide. If you, if you watch the local news or you read the local newspaper in North Carolina, all day, every day for a week straight now, it's been nonstop coverage, uh, front page above the fold, top of the broadcast of every major uh, broadcast in Raleigh and other major cities throughout the state of this scandal. Uh, this is uh, has absolutely permeated the public mind down there, and people are concerned that if Cal Cunningham were to be elected to the U.S. Senate, this Democrat would be a national security risk and would be somebody who uh, 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 would have a cloud over him that he would not be able to execute the duties of the office faithfully uh, if, if the voters were to send him there. So I think that's really ca causing people second get to second guess and can, can reconsider their choice there. But the thing is that uh, you know, for Biden to win North Carolina, 
uh, which has been a state that's been trending Republican for many years. R- Mitt Romney, it was the only battleground state he flipped back from Barack Obama in 2012. Mm. The, um, uh, for, for Biden to flip it back to the Democrats uh, for the first time in over a decade, he would have to uh, have a really strong performance down ticket from Cal Cunningham. And this is severely damaging Joe Biden's chances to win the state of North Carolina. Also, Biden and Kamala Harris have been, remained silent about the scandal until now. But the fact that she hasn't weighed in at all is particularly noteworthy. It's, it's safe to assume, I think, at this stage that her silence is uh, disapproval of her husband's actions. And, and, and again, there's, this is broader than just a, a sex scandal. This is a national security scandal uh, and a military scandal. And, mm-hmm. and again, somebody with this lack of judgment can't be trusted to, uh, to serve in the United States Senate. So then the question really becomes, why did Joe Biden endorse him? Joe Biden endorsed the guy, right? right. So does Joe Biden stand by that endorsement? What about uh, other uh, Democrats? There's 38 Democrats in the U.S. Senate that have donated to his campaign. Are they okay with that money? You know, is that the, it, it, and so on and so forth. There's so many questions here. And I think that it's opened the floodgates in North Carolina in a way that uh, uh, for Senator Tillis uh, cleared the path for him to win re-election and cleared the path for President Trump to defeat uh, Joe Biden. Interesting. Matt Boyle, Washington political editor at Breitbart News. Thanks for joining me today. All right. Thanks for having me. This is the Kaya Olson Show. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Kyle Olson Show. Another one of my colleagues at Breitbart News and former Michigander, Rebecca Mansour, recently wrote about how the Democrats are using vote-by-mail chaos to try to win the election, and she joins me now. So, Rebecca, begin laying out what that seven-step strategy is that you say the Democrats are following. Well, Kyle, we're seeing it in real time. Um, First of all, we know that the pandemic rules have been very let's just say different for everybody. I mean, we are told that we are not allowed to uh, you know, have ma- large gatherings, but we're allowed to riot essentially in the streets. We're, mm-hmm. we're told all of these different conflicting things, but we are definitely told that we are not safe to go to the polls. That was something that was made very clear. Um, as early as April, there was a big push saying that people can't go to the polls. We have to have vote by mail. And the Democrats used all of the tools in their very considerable media uh, and, and, and entertainment arsenal in order to get this message out. In fact, um, Andrew Breitbart liked to call it the Democrat media complex to explain mm-hmm. how the media works in lockstep with the interests of uh, the Democratic Party. And I mean, you could see it right from the, the beginning with Hollywood. Uh, we had you know, these large sort of virtual uh, get out the vote by mail uh, galas starting as early as April with Tom Hanks and his wife meeting, you know, and and Michelle Obama and all this. So they were getting out that message really clearly that we have to have vote by mail. And this was a long time coming also because uh, various organizations on the left, many of them funded by George Soros, have been trying to expand vote by mail for quite some time. Uh, And these organizations have also been trying to expand just um, access to voting or as you know, for a long time as well. And what I mean by that is they fight to extend voting rights to you know, everyone, including like ex-felons, you name it. And yet at the same time, they also fight any legislation that would try to clean up our voting rolls, close any loopholes in our voting system that, that allows for fraud. They fight that as well. Like they fight any effort for voter ID. They fight any effort, uh, again, to you know, clean up the voting rolls of people who are dead or no longer living in the jurisdiction where they had registered to vote, all those things. So that's the sort of framework that we have right now. And now with the vote by mail, what the part of the chaos of this is that each state has different rules, different um, you know uh, rules on who can is a, is able to vote by mail, rules on when uh, how they're going to send out ballots to people. So some states are just sending out ballots directly to anybody that's on their vote registered to vote. Like mm-hmm. for example, in California, they just mailed us ballots. Uh, irrespective of whether the people that are registered are still alive, are still at their address, it doesn't matter. They just sent them all out. This is a very serious problem because, as I said, many people are dead. These voting rolls are not up to date, as we've seen again and again. 
Um, so that's also a really big problem. Then other states are like Michigan are just sending out applications for vote by mail ballots. That's you know, at least a little bit safer because you have to take the initiative to respond and to apply after you get that little, you know, application. But there's also kind of uh, questions about who is able to send out those things. So some states, you can just, any outside group can just go to the state's website, download a form and send out applications to vote by mail to everybody on a mailing list. And that's why we see some people getting applications to vote by mail for their dead animals like mm -hmm. a, a couple in georgia got an application to vote by mail or an application to register to vote um for a dead house cat that had been dead for like 10 years or something mm -hmm. and this happens because if any of your listeners if they have ever um given their pet's name uh for a mailing list or something because they didn't want junk mail in their own name that's how this happens so mm -hmm. you have like stuff like that and then you also have some states are loosening whatever safeguards they had in place for vote by mail like uh for example some states require um signature verification on your vote by mail ma ballot some states also require an additional witness signature on that vote by mail ballot or a notary signature and then some states even require you to put a copy of your uh, ID, your state ID, like your driver's license or something, within the uh, envelope with your vote by mail ballot. So some states mm. are very strict. Others mm -hmm. have absolutely no guardrails. Others are just, you know, messing with it as they go because they've never done this before. And the problem is, we also don't know if the if our, you know, postal service can even take all of this. Uh, this is a huge burden on the postal service to get all of these ballots in in a timely manner. And as we we're seeing these stories where ballots just go missing, you know, ballots are dumped or ballots are not getting there in time. We saw this with the primaries. Um, this is just a recipe for chaos. We also see that, look, the further that you get away from requiring people to vote in person, the you know, more you expand the avenues for fraud. And that's what we're seeing. And, and this is real, real concern. And this has happened, we've seen this sort of thing happen in the past as well. I mean, there was actually, the New York Post uh, did a whole piece with an anonymous Democratic operative talking about the sort of ways that they gamed uh, voter fraud in the past, including vote by mail fraud, where they would, you know, steal an envelope, harvest an envelope, uh, harvest ballots, uh, change the, you know, the ballot, reseal it, send it out, or just disappear ballots from like, let's say a district that leans, you know, Republican. And we're seeing stories of like, you know, bunches of ballots just, you know, found someplace. I mean, there's just so many different ways that this thing can be gamed, including the fact that, look, in, in, uh, in some states, we know now that a number of people uh, voted twice in in uh, mm -hmm. Georgia, for example, in the last uh, in the primary election, there were like a, you know over a thousand people that voted twice. They voted by mail and then showed up and voted at the polls. Um, whether that was you know an accident or designed, who knows? We also have people getting multiple ballots at their address because uh, from for people who live there, you know, prior to them. Mm -hmm. So it's like this is just an opportunity to game, and then. Not only that, now we have the left also using the courts to try to loosen up any sort of guardrails that are already in place. Like for example, and there's been a number of victories that they've already scored using the courts. Um, they've extended the amount of time that you can receive these ballots. It, it even made it so that you don't even have to have a postmark that's visible on them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've, uh, Michigan is gonna have what? Like a two week window practically. They're also allowing this fraud friendly practice called ballot harvesting, where essentially somebody can go out and collect your ballot for you, helpfully, and essentially go to the sure, knock on your right. door and say, hey, let me help you fill out that ballot too. I mean, this is, this is just total fraud friendly, uh, you know, practice here. You're you know, harvesting ballots, literally. It's legal in California, by the way, and in a number of other uh, third world countries where you know, <laughs> they have battle, you know, about election monitoring and we're and we're just about out of time but the last point the last you have several points and, and i encourage everybody to go to breitbart.com and find this story the seven step uh, strategy democrats are using to win the election by using vote by mail chaos but the last point and like i said we've only got a couple seconds um but it says the last point is let chief justice john roberts or the new justice pick the next president or let nancy pelosi do it what does that mean 
Well, this could, just like the 2000 election, remember it went all the way up to the Supreme Court finally, because somebody had to stop the, you know, recount in Florida. It was, they were just trying to count as many times as they could in order for, to finally get a count where Al Gore won. Somebody had to stop the chaos and it got all the way to the Supreme Court. Now, in this case, if we do not have a, a replacement for um, Justice Ginsburg, it's going to be a 4-4 court. And do we really think that John Roberts is going to stick his neck out and vote mm -hmm. with the conservatives, um, you know, in a 4-4 court? That's questionable. And But Len, let's say that Amy Coney Barrett uh, gets confirmed in time. It could be a 5-4 decision with Amy Coney Barrett casting that deciding vote. The left is going to lose their mind if that mm -hmm. happens also, just FYI. But it, in, in another instance, it might just go to Nancy Pelosi, because look, if by January, if we do not have uh, one candidate or the other having enough um, electoral votes, uh, according to the Constitution, it goes to the House. In the House, each uh, House delegation, each state gets one vote. The House then gets to vote for the president. And here's the kicker, folks. Uh, even though the Democrats control the House, Republicans have the majority in more state delegations. Uh, therefore, the Republicans actually could vote, could vote in Donald Trump. And I mean, the Democrats could try to game it. They could try to like hold off a quorum and all that. But the Constitution is pretty clear. And so is, uh, you know, passed um, voting right uh, legislation, the Voting Right Act, um, that a quorum for this purpose is just one person from the state delegation. So just well, but one lone Republican from these states, uh, delegations could show up and vote for Donald Trump. Well, but then, of course... Um, it's very possible that the Republicans could take back the House. So then, when would that vote take place? Would it take when there would it take place when there is you know on, on January first when there is still a Speaker Nancy Pelosi, or would it take place uh, whenever the swearing in is? That that remains to be seen. So, I mean, it's we are it. This is it's high stakes. It's high stake high stakes what's going on. But unfortunately, we're out of time. Rebecca Mansour, Senior Editor at Large at Breitbart News. Thanks for joining me today. Right on, Kyle. Thank you so much for joining me today. For more of my work, go to Breitbart.com or find me on Twitter, Kyle Olson 4. Use the same handle for Parlor, Kyle Olson 4. K-Y-L-E-O-L-S-O-N and the number four. This is the Kyle Olson Show.